morning, everyone. Little Sprocket was sitting up nice and proud this morning, uh, right up until the point of time that I went live and she decided to lie down. And uh, But she has her bow tie on today. She wanted to get spiffed up for our, re our Remembrance Day service today. Earlier this morning uh, in the emails, I sent out a copy of today's service, but um, within it were video links for um, some amazing music, uh, the last post, and uh, the route, and, and different things like that. And uh, while I know a lot of you like to read these things on Sunday morning, um, I would encourage you if, to either save them or re redo the whole service again on Wednesday, which is Remembrance Day, and, uh, and share in that moment as well with uh, people around the world. Big shout out to the Gibsons to say thank you for your musical contributions once again. You're becoming real YouTube stars. It's fantastic. And um, I just love how um, giving you are in your musical talent. Well, we will begin our service this morning with an act of remembrance. As we remember in silence before God, those who made the ultimate sacrifice, let us commend their souls anew to God's eternal mercy and compassion. And let us pray that God would grant us grace to serve faithfully until our life's end to the honor and glory of God's holy name. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. For thousands of years, indigenous people have walked on this land in their own country. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives. We acknowledge the Chippewa, Iroquois, and Algonquin people, past, present, and their emerging leaders for their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. And may we promise and challenge ourselves to make truth and reconciliation a re real in our community of faith, here and in our daily lives. I would like to share with you now a poem that was written in May of 1915 by John McRae in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amongst their guns below. We are the dead, short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Fields. We move now to our call to worship. We stand in silence, remembering the death. We stand in silence, remembering the destruction. We stand in silence, remembering the loss. We stand in silence, remembering the horror of war to the soldiers, to the women, men, and children, to the land and all that lives on it. We stand in silence, remembering, waiting, watching, working for peace in our lives, in our community, in our country, in our world. And all these things, with all these things, we worship God. Let us pray. Make your ways known upon earth, glory God, your saving power among all peoples. Renew your church in holiness and help us to serve you with joy. Guide the leaders of all nations that justice may prevail throughout the world. Let not the needy be forgotten, 
nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Make us instruments of your peace and let your glory be over all the earth as we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, we move now to our scripture passage for today. It's from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And I've taken this version of the reading from the book entitled The Message. So may we open ourselves to the seeds of wisdom that lie dormant in this reading. And may our minds be fertile soil on which it may grow strong and true. There's a right time for everything. There's an opportune time to do things, a right time for everything on the earth, a time for birth and another for death, a right time to plant and another to reap, a right time to kill and another to heal, a right time to destroy and another to construct, a right time to cry and another to laugh, a right time to lament and another to cheer. A right time to make love and another to abstain. A right time to embrace and another to part. A right time to search and another to count your losses. A right time to hold on and another to let go. A right time to rip up out and another to mend. A right time to shout up, to shut up, and another to speak up. A right time to love and another to hate. A right time to wage war and another to make peace. May the Spirit bless us with wisdom and wonder as we ponder the meaning of these words for our lives. And for our young at time for the young at heart. The story is about the poppy. Now, as you know, the poppy is the enduring symbol of remembrance of the First World War. And it's strongly linked with November 11th, but the poppy's origin as a popular symbol of remembrance lies in the landscapes of our First World War. Poppies were a common sight, especially on the Western Front. They flourished in the, in the soil churned up by the fighting and by the shells. And the flower provided Canadian doctor John McRae with the inspira inspiration for his poem in Flanders Field, which he wrote while serving in, from 1915. But in 1918, in response to McRae's poem, American humanitarian Wanya Michael wrote, and now the torch and poppy red we wear in honor of our dead. She campaigned to make the poppy a symbol of remembrance for those who had died in the war. Artificial poppies were, the first, were first sold in Britain in 1921 to raise money for the Earl Haig Fund in support of ex-servicemen and their families and the families of those who had died in the conflict. They were supplied by Anna Gurin, who had been manufacturing the flower in France to raise money for war orphans. Selling poppies proved so popular that in 1922, the British Legion founded a factory staffed by disabled ex-servicemen to produce its own, and it continues to do so today. Other charities sell poppies in different colors, each with their own meaning, but to all to, con uh, to commemorate the losses of war. White poppies, for example, symbolize peace without violence and purple poppies are worn to honor the animals killed in conflict. Today, our poppies continue to be sold worldwide to raise money and to remember those who lost their lives in the First World War and its subse subsequent conflict. I'm sure many of you have seen the commercial now of the war veteran sitting at his computer making his poppy donation online. 
I believe the catchphrase is, if he can do it, you can do it. Let us remember. Our sermon this morning is based on two remarkable men. Men that you may have had the chance to meet. Uh, Jack from Bethune, who was from Bethune, Baysville, and Ray, who attends uh, Knox in Port Sydney. I'd like to share with you uh, this poem, The Ode to Remembrance by Lawrence Byton, entitled For the Fallen, which was first published in the Times in 1914. They went with songs to the battle, they were young, straight of limb, true of eye, steady and aglow. They were staunch to the end against odds uncounted, and they fell with their faces to the foe. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. They mingle not with their laughing comrades again. They sit no more at familiar tables of home. They have no lot in our labor of the daytime. They sleep beyond England's home. So I'd like to share with you now a few stories of the two men, Jack Thompson and Ray Townsend, who both served in the Second World War and have both published books about their wartime memories. Today I will be sharing with you a story from each of those publications. And let's begin with Jack Thompson, Warrant Officer, First Class. This comes from Jack's book entitled, Where the Hell is John O'Groats? An, autobi an autobiography of Jack Thompson. And it's funny, you know, because uh, when Jack told me the, the title of his book, he apologized for the title for the one word that is in it that he felt would bring uh, much offense to me. But Jack, it's a wonderful title, and I know now why you, why you chose that title. So here's Jack's story. We still had a day left on our leave in London, and I wasn't feeling too good. Our crew decided to stay in London for the last day. I went to bed early because of the headache I had developed. My roommate, Robbie Robertson, decided to come with me as he was concerned about my condition. I tried to get to sleep, but it was no use as the headache just got worse. Robbie thought he had better get our crew captain, George Cron, the pilot, and see what he thought about my trouble. So he phoned a Canadian Army Medical Center that was on our leave form. It was, it was to be used only in an emergency. It was for the military to use only in such a case like mine. George told me I wouldn't be able to fly in the condition I was in and that I would have to wait until it was corrected. But how did George know all this? Well, you would think he was a doctor the way he was explaining things. Well, it just so happened that he had some sinus trouble himself before he joined the Air Force. He had been afraid that the RCAF would not accept him. He knew what he was talking about as the medical officer confirmed my condition. The medical officer said to me, you'll have to spend time, some time in the hospital, perhaps a week or so until we get you ready to fly again. That was the worst statement I ever wanted to hear. It meant I would be separated from my crew. During the period of my recuperation, my crew would be flying operations with a spare wireless operator and they would finish their tour ahead of me. They could be posted home to Canada and I would still be flying England, finishing out my tour. A crew likes to be together, especially when their tour is finished and they get to go home. But it wasn't to be. The gods of war had stopped smiling on me and were now laughing their heads off. First, I had to stay at the Canadian Army Hospital for two weeks instead of one. I had to take these pills that were the size of 50 cent pieces, two every eight hours. They were a sulfur drug of some kind, and it was like trying to swallow barbed wire. After two weeks passed, I asked for a discharge, and to my surprise, the medical officer granted it to me. It was given, I was given a warrant to travel back to my squadron by train. When I got back, 
I saw that all our planes had been painted with black and white stripes. This meant that the invasion of Europe had, was about to begin. All Allied planes were painted this way to identify them from each other. Any that weren't painted black and white were considered fair game for our fighters to shoot down. Our crew had been out flying, back flying for a week when I was called to the commanding officer for an interview with him. Jack, you better take some time off and try to forget about things, the commanding officer said. You've had a tough couple of weeks. I'll call you when we need you. At first, I didn't like being unable to fly, as I was anxious to make up the flying time I had missed when I was in the hospital. I wanted to finish my tour of operations at the same time as my crew did. Then we would be screened and sent home together. This didn't hold any water with the commanding officer. He insisted that I take some time off and relax for a while. He said, I will get a spare wireless operator to take your place with the crew. That was the final decision. And I went back to my quarters, a very unhappy man. As I reached my living quarters, my pilot met me with the news that I wouldn't be flying with their crew for a while. His crew was scheduled to fly that night. I wished him luck and we parted ways. Little did I know that would be the last time I saw him. He and his crew were shot down over the coast of Holland that night. They, when their time of arrival was overdue, the commanding officer came and notified me that he feared the worst and that my crew had been shot down. None of my crew survived the crash. We move now to Ray's story. His book is entitled, My War Years, 101 Overseas Letters Found 65 Years Later by E. Ray Townsend. This entry in Ray's book is in, um, dated April 2nd, 1945. The battalion moved off at 6 a.m. to approach the 20 Canal. The Royal Regiment carried aboard tanks and carriers and shivered through the wind-driven showers that led the attack. I remember throwing my remaining chocolate bars to exuberant Dutch people who ran to meet us as we sped along the 20 Canal, hoping to reach the bridge before the Germans could blow it up. A short distance before reaching the canal, we dismounted from the armored vehicles and spread out line abreast and prepared to advance. About this time, we heard a loud boom explosion ahead of us. The bridge charges had been set off. An officer and two others were sent ahead to see if the bridge was intact, or at least unusable for the infantry to cross. While we waited, my section was lying behind 14-inch diameter pine trees atop a dike. Sniper fire had occurred on either side of us, but we couldn't spot the offender. However, we got a little careless, and the man to the right of me shifted his position and exposed his head as he chatted to me. Crack! A bullet just missed him, cutting through the bark of the tree an inch or two above his head. That got our attention, for sure. A few minutes later, we withdrew from the bridge, but not before another man was shot through the fleshy part of his neck. Although bleeding, he was still smiling. For him, the war was over. He was going home. Now, lined up in a sheltering ravine, he waited. we waited for word to advance. The officer had sighted the destroyed bridge and reported it unusable. However, the area before the canal had to be cleared. B Company, with my section in the lead, was to head the attack. As we waited for the word to move off, I remember taking a hard tack biscuit out of my pocket and started to eat it. Then we got the order to fix bayonets. My mouth went dry, and I think I spat out the last bits of dry crumb. Advancing a few feet to the right of a tank, I wondered if I should have joined the tank corps instead of the infantry. No sniper was going to get the crew inside that heavily armored tank. Our advance move, our advance move across an open field past a large four-story building. We reached the canal and started to retreat above the large open field. We hadn't found the sniper or snipers who had may have fired on us from the other side of the canal. And with our backs to them, our officers wisely, wisely told us to move along as fast as we could. There was a low barbed wire fence across the middle of the field with an open gate. Our sergeant wisely noted, 
Don't everybody go through that gate. It's an ideal spot for a sniper, sniper to concentrate on. Being tired like a lot of the others, I disregarded the advice and passed through the gate. April 3rd, 1945. It was getting dark when a strong enemy counterattack began against B Company. From my second floor window, we observed a line of infantry advancing in the distance. and We opened fire on them. As darkness fell, enemy tracer shells arced towards us. Their, these gave direction to the attacking soldiers, but you got the impression they were all heading for you. Down the road from a crossroads, a tank appeared, perhaps others still unseen. Its first round knocked out a six pounder anti-tank gun beside the railroad station. Still advancing, its second round struck just below into the left of my window smashing through the masonry wall and shattering the stairs to the second floor. The major below shouted for us to come down. The building was now dark and filled with a cloud of white dust. With my Bren gun in my hand and my left on the stairway railing, I managed to jump over the hole in the stairs. We were told to go outside, which we did. The we being my window mate. The shelling was heavy. The tank or tanks advanced right onto our position, but the other tanks were beaten off before reaching us. I was told later that a tank officer peering out of his tank turret was shot and the tank turned around and headed back. Not being with my section, I lay under a large pine tree when a shell burst above, possibly uh, hitting the, the, when a shell burst above, uh, possibly hitting the branches. The shrapnel cut off several large branches which, which fell on me. Had they not hit the branches, I'm sure I would have been mortally wounded. As it was, I received what I called a God-sent small fragment, which I didn't know about until daylight, when my blood-stained arm was observed. The Major's radio man was among the four dead. Four men were missing, and 23 had been wounded in what was the heaviest counterattack of the day. The Battle of the Twenty Canal was not over for the Royal Regiment, but it was for me, as I and others, including two Germans, were ex evacuated to a rear dressing station, 88 British General. My next stop was the number 12 Canadian Hospital in Belgium on the 5th of April. I was really exhausted, and I think I slept most of the next two days. My war companions were in my category, the walking wounded. A neighboring ward I walked through really impressed me as to my good fortune. Some of them were not going to make it. Two amazing men, two amazing stories. And there are thousands upon thousands of these stories from both sides of the war that need to be shared. And there are thousands of thank yous that need to be said by each and every one of us. I would like to finish off this morning's message with a quote from my friend Jack. Therefore, but by the grace of God, I go. Amen. Our minute for mission this morning is a Mish Kid of China by Betty Gale. The United Church of Canada has a rich history of saints who have gone before us but whose influence is still being felt. For many in the West End of Toronto, it was one strong, kind woman who showed those who encountered her just the amazing things mission and service can do. Betty Gale Nee Thompson was one of these saints. Betty grew up in China as one of several mish kids, missionary kids, born to missionary parents in North China. She returned in the 1930s after nursing training in Canada at the urging of Dr. Robert McClure, and it was there that she met and married Dr. Godfrey Gale. They had their first child, Maggie, just before the Japanese invaded China in 1941, which led first to house arrest and then three years of internment in a prisoner of war camp around North China. Margie had just, just before the Jap, they had their first child, Sorry. Betty kept a journal of her family's time during the war, detailing the poor treatment and horrible conditions of the buildings that they lived in. 
But even during the worst times, Betty was always able to find something funny or hopeful to share. The Second World War took its toll on the missionaries. Years later, Betty and Godfrey gave a painful account of the illness and death of Eric Little, a Scottish missionary and athlete in the 1924 Olympics. Another Mish kid who had returned to China to work within his family's mission. His story became famous in the 1981 movie Chariots of Fire. The missionaries' passion for making a difference in the lives of people in other parts of the world, as well as at home, have ins has inspired many to follow in their footsteps. Betty and Godfrey's story and passion live on in those who have, they have influenced. Thanks to mission and service, they are part of a great cloud of witnesses that the United Church of Canada of today is built upon. We will remember them. Mission and service is already a part of your life of faith. Thank you so much. If you have not given, please join me in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith. Loving our neighbor is at the heart of our mission and service. I'd like to take this time now to thank everyone who has contributed to our offerings for Bethune and Knox United Church, for those who continue with PAR, for those who have generously given on our Facebook page with the donation button, and for those who send in their uh, requests through our treasurer and your gifts. Thank you so much. And so with those gifts in mind, we will now pray a blessing upon them. Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we present our offerings this day, may we not seek to be consoled, but to console, nor look to under understanding hearts, but to look for hearts to understand. May we not look for love's return, but seek to love unselfishly, for in our giving we receive, and in forgiving are forgiven. Amen. Well, we move now to our prayers of the people. And once again, because this is a live forum, if there is someone for whom you would like to have prayers said, please don't hesitate to contact me and I will add them to my daily prayers as well. Let us pray. Let us pray for all who suffer as a result of conflict and ask that God may give us peace. For the servicemen and women who have died in the violence of war, each one remembered by and known to God, may God give peace. For those who love them in death as in life, offering the distress of our grief and the sadness of our loss, may God give peace. For all members of the armed forces who are in danger this day, remembering family, friends, and all who pray for their safe return, may God give peace. For civilian women, children, and men whose lives are disfigured by war or terror, calling to mind in penitence the anger and hatreds of humanity, may God give peace. For peacemakers and peacekeepers who seek to keep this world secure and free, may God give peace. For all who bear the burden and privilege of leadership, political, military, and religious, asking for gifts of wisdom and resolve in the search for reconciliation and peace, may God give peace. O God of truth and justice, we hold before you those whose memory we cherish and those whose names we will never know. Lift us to help us to lift our eyes above the torment of this broken world and grant us the grace to pray for those who wish us harm. As we honor the past, may we put our faith in your future, for you are the source of life and hope, now and forevermore. Amen. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not wither them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we shall remember them. Friends, go now in peace and love. Stay well. God bless.
and keep you forever. Grant you peace, perfect peace, courage in every endeavor. Lift up your eyes and see God's face and God's grace forever. May the Lord mighty God